you first gained real attention in New York from the media when you started playing the supper clubs. Yes, I was very, very fortunate that my then manager, Baron Poland, had put me into the St. Regis Hotel mm -hmm. on 55th and 5th Avenue, which was then owned privately by the late Vincent Astor. And it was quite a posh hotel. Very classy, very lovely, beautiful service. Staff had been there 30, 40 years. I mean, it was very special. And uh, I worked uh, in the Maisonette room, which was a, a lower level uh, at the uh, St. Regis Hotel. It was very elegant, terribly expensive, small, on team. And uh, there was a wonderful orchestra leader called Milt Shaw who played the violin and had a um, society orchestra. And uh, I went in for two weeks and uh, stayed the whole season. So it was a, a tremendous uh, surprise mm -hmm. and uh, a wonderful uh, happening for me and for, uh, for my career. And so the St. Regis became my jumping off place. And uh, kind of I feel as though I grew up at the St. Regis Hotel. Well, what better literally. place to grow up? <laughs> it, was, it was lovely, and they were all very good to me. And uh, my manager, Baron, uh, was able to uh, put me into some uh, good shows and uh, get all kinds of good auditions for me. And, I had a lot of press, and uh, I'm very lucky, I tell you, very lucky indeed. But I had a lot of help. Mm -hmm. We all need that. That's important. You became prominent on the Broadway scene when you replaced Lisa Kirk in uh, Kiss Me Kate. Yes, that was my first, uh, my first part. That was my first part. My first show was Three to Make Ready, a very vulgar show in 1946. Mm -hmm after I had done the production numbers of the Copacabana, introducing the coffee song. Remember that song? We got an awful lot of coffee in Brazil. It was fun. But uh, the Kiss Me Kate was, uh, the role of Bianca was one terrific part. And uh, Lisa Kirk had gone to California to make a screen test. So they brought me in from the uh, national company, which had like a six or seven or eight month run in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I, I had been there about six months. And Ann Jeffries was, was Kate. Uh -huh. And Keith Andes was the very handsome debonair role that uh, Drake played. And it was, uh, it was an exciting show. Uh, that, that show was one that really did. Bella Spivak wrote the book and uh, uh, the, the Porter music and all. It, it really held its it's time. It never dated. It, it's always fun. It's always. Um, it, it doesn't seem dated in, in, in the way that so many of the other musicals have. It's, uh, it's been a very popular show. I think it's a dynamite musical. Do you think Sondheim's musical, 20 years down the road, will seem dated, or how do you see them being received? Well, uh, as I said before, I think Sondheim is very much ahead of his time. So I, I, I don't think they will sing David because he is so advanced. And uh, I mean, when you think of what that man has done and those magnificent uh, lyrics that he's written, let alone the fabulous music, mm -hmm. uh, to so many shows at such a young age, I mean, he really is prolific. You just wonder if that brilliant man will ever have a dry spot, you know, with, uh, with all the creativity that he has and his invested uh, knowledge in, in, into people's emotions. He has such an insight into people and their deep thoughts and emotions. He's, he's quite incredible, I think. Well, you've been in three of his musicals, if I'm not mistaken. True. And, um, do you think musical comedy, for the most part, is taking a turn where it's becoming closer to the heart? It's dealing with subjects that are, well, 20 years ago would not be considered subjects for musical comedy?
I think that's a, that's a very good. Uh, that's, a, that's 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 very wise. Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I think uh, I'm surprised. You know that uh, that they do uh, the subjects mm -hmm. uh, today. You know, that, and that they attempt and and do well with uh, such uh, intimate. creative things, having a baby, things of that nature. I mean, uh, there, there don't seem to be any bars anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just as though, uh, you know, they've done it all. Now, now, where do we go from here? Maybe they'll swing back the other way. I don't know. Did you find it heartbreaking out of the nightclub singer image and being taken seriously as an actress? Do you think appearing in musicals helped that, to change that image? Well, I really was never aware, in a sense, that I had much of an image or that I had been accepted as an actress. I just felt damn lucky to, <laughs> to get my teeth into a part <laughs> <laughs> and uh, enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, I would like to do some straight acting. I really would. But I enjoy the closeness mm -hmm. of the cabaret audiences so much that I, I, I can't, I'm not unhappy. I mean, I, I like what I do. Well, people can communicate so well through music. Yes. It's a wonderful medium. It's, uh, I, I feel very privileged that uh, I've been able to uh, continue and to uh, work as much as I have and uh, to be accepted to uh, back, you know, as though I never left the scene. It's, uh, it's been very rewarding. It's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. But uh, I just want to get better. You know, mm -hmm. I want to be able to do more, to express more, and to be more encompassing, and uh, just to be a better performer all the way around. When you're looking for songs to sing, what, what's the first thing you look for? Is, the, is it the melody line or the words? or? It's, it's always the words. It's the story. The mm -hmm. lyric is all important. Are there any particular types of songs that you're attracted to? Well, I, I am very much in tune with... Uh, I like bittersweet. Mm -hmm. I like uh, I like honesty, I, and and still I I like uh, the sense of uh, the ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I like a lot of things, and I think uh, I think that's that's the fun of of presenting uh, a person in cabaret. You can touch. Mm -hmm. on many areas and uh, reach people and I look at it this way if I don't get them on one maybe I'll get them on the other <laughs> but it's, it's exciting and it's fun and it's very challenging always of course I've never been satisfied with my voice I've been studying with Keith Davis for over 20 years mm -hmm. and, uh, and and I will study with him as long as uh, there is any possible way to do so as long as he is, uh, continues to teach I will try and uh, keep going uh, with him. Uh, well, you had spent time at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London. Yes, I spent a year there. There was a teacher there who was very influential on your singing. Uh, my teacher, uh, my voice teacher in London was not, was not uh, of uh, the Royal Academy no. of Dramatic Arts, uh, but I had a, a very fine uh, a woman teacher there who insisted that I should not try and acquire a British accent. She said, my charm is being Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> and she thought I should stick to that. But I worked with, a, with, a, with another fine teacher, uh, besides Keith Davis, uh, who was there uh, in England. He was uh, Russian and Greek and Italian. 
a very tiny mm-hmm. little man called George Cunelli. Right. And he had a lot of uh, influence with his uh, pupils. And he worked very hard and very long hours, as does Mr. Davis. And uh, he helped an enormous amount of people, as a good teacher always does. And Mr. Davis, I feel I couldn't get by without. Uh, but but George Cunelli taught until he uh, was 93, up until 10 days before he died, which I think is absolutely incredible. Well, that's quite admirable, yes. <laughs> to say the I, least. He was a, a t- t- tremendous person. How did you find London audiences as opposed to New York audiences? Do you think there's a big difference? Uh, I find... I found, rather, the London audience is much more reserved Mm -hmm. with cabaret. Uh, They did not uh, go all out like a lot of American audiences, and particularly New York audiences. Um, But in theater, they were more relaxed and more outgoing and, uh, and they let you know in a big hurry if they liked you. I had a wonderful experience uh, opening uh, in London in an English show with a very gorgeous uh, English star of Sally Ann House. Right. And her father had been a great mm-hmm. British star, Bobby House. Was this Bet Your Life? Yes. Right. And uh, we had... Uh, we had uh, worked so hard on the show and had uh, tested it and worked on it and rehearsed and played and played in Manchester. We were there eight weeks and it was freezing cold. That damp went right through me. I never quite got used to that, but I did adore London. I still do. I'm dying to go back to work there. How did uh, this Midwesterner mix with royalty? Oh well, I I was only I was only introduced just uh, at a at a private uh, function mm-hmm. where I was asked to sing one of those things. I was a, a nervous wreck, total nervous wreck. But I I have great admiration for the royal family, and the Queen Mother had come to visit us at Rada when I was there, and we were all in the state. I mean, really, but. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, uh, it, it, was, it was a wonderful time to be there, but on our opening night, they did not like our show, and they gave us the raspberry in no uncertain terms. You know, we, we were booed, and that was a little uh, hard to take. It was uh, very disappointing. Mm-hmm. But uh, when they like you, they like you. When they don't, they let you know it. It wasn't uh, anything personal. It was just that the show was a disappointment to So uh, we got the bird, as they say. I'll never forget it. Oh, that was a night of nights. We had a horse on stage. The horse went to the bathroom. I mean, <laughs> I mean you, you, you just mentioned it, and everything happened, really. It was, it was quite an experience. But in, in spite of the raspberries of right. opening night and the whole thing, the show ran for two years. So. <laughs> So that's the kind of loyal public the, the British are. I mean, if they like you personally, they will come to the show in spite of bad reviews. We do have to break for a commercial message. We'll be back in a moment with Julie Wilson. Having rose to real prominence on the West End, did you find it hard coming back to New York and becoming established here as a major Broadway performer? Uh, not really. Uh, I was uh, very lucky. I was uh, offered uh, the lead in Pajama Game mm-hmm. while I was still in London. And uh, I was trying to work on a soprano voice, which uh, was something that I felt I had to do. Oh, Shades of Patricia Morris. <laughs> uh, yes. And. Uh, uh, I finally did get back and uh, uh, auditioned for Rodgers and Hammerstein for uh, one of the parts in Pipe Dream. Mm-hmm. P.S. I didn't get the job. <laughs> and they said, your voice is terrible, Julie. What, what did you do? What did you do? They said, we, we, we thought you were wonderful in South Pacific. What did you do to your voice? I said, 
I was trying to improve. I said, I was trying to be a soprano. And they said, well, forget it. They said, we can name at least 5,000 brilliant sopranos that we have no parts for, no jobs for. So they said, why don't you just stick to what God gave you and uh, appreciate it and, uh, and not try and be a soprano. So. How did you take that coming from Rogers and Hammerstein? Well, I said, okay, uh, you've made your point, <laughs> right? <laughs> But, uh, but that's all right. It's something I had to go through, and um, I had to try, and I did. So at least I got it out of my system, mm -hmm. right? See, now, if I hadn't done that, all these years I would have said, but I should have been a soprano, <laughs> you see? Now I'm just happy being myself. Well, I'm glad they wised you up to the truth. <laughs> How did you find the pajama game? That was something you would turn down when you were in London. At the uh, well, uh, I... I just uh, wanted to stay there and study, and that was very important to me at that time. And uh, I thought, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, when you're young, you always think everything's going to come again. Mm -hmm. One never realizes that this could be the opportunity of your life and you should grab it. I wasn't bright enough to realize it. And my wonderful manager, Baron Poland, uh, was very disappointed in me. and did his utmost to make me see the light and to reason with me and to, to tell me how important it was and what a great opportunity uh, and compliment this was to, to have been offered this role. But I was stubborn and uh, so I, uh, I blotted my copy book, as they say. Mm -hmm. So I wound up as a replacement a year later. Which is all right. I enjoyed it. You know, that's it. interesting, because Sally Ann Howes was offered Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady before Julie Andrews. And was she really? She I did not know She came in that. as a replacement. Well, I saw both of them, and they were both magnificent. I think Julie Andrews is superb, and I think Sally is a lovely actress. Beautiful woman. How did you find your, the training that you had received at the Royal Academy in England? It was an interesting experience, but um, Sir Kenneth Barnes, who at that time was the head of the school, said, uh, he said, I find you are a very strong personality. Mm -hmm. He said, you are very much yourself. And he said, uh, when I see you in a role, he said, I don't see you as the character. He said, I see you. And uh, he said, it can be good and it can be bad. But, uh, uh, see, I was 28, and I'd been in the business 10 years. I worked very hard, and uh, all the other people at, uh, in my class were young people who were 18, 19, and who were just beginning. And they found it rather odd that I wanted to be there, uh, you know, after having played uh, three shows on in the West End of London. And, uh, but uh, I think it reverts back to not having finished school and that need to I'm sure have a does. more academic uh, training. And I just felt it would give me something. Whether it did or not, I'm not sure. But I thoroughly enjoyed my teacher, Nan Morell, and uh, the other teachers, and Sir Kenneth Barnes, and the other students, uh, a very fine actor uh, who's in a play now that I dearly love to see, uh, Donald Muffet, was one of my cohorts. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, was, he was good then, very strong. And uh, Rosemary Harris uh, was the shining light of Radha in her class, which was before mine. And I saw her do a performance of the heiress, and she was magnificent. And she's, a, she's a brilliant actress. And uh, it, uh, it, was, it was all good. I think it's uh, what you learn, something rubs off. And the mm -hmm. people you're with rub off, the director, the other actors, what you do in life, the people you meet. It all makes you who you are and what you are. It's all some somehow it, it, it's all important you'd become a mother later than most women of your generation oh later <laughs> my, I should be a grandma instead of a mama 
I had my first son, uh, Quinn Holt, uh, with him. his uh, father is a uh, producer. He'd been divorced about 14 years. Michael McAllen is his name, boy's father. And uh, we were married to about two and a half years before Holt was born. And uh, I was doing uh, the lead at Paper Mill Playhouse in Gypsy, mm -hmm. playing Madame Rose. When I discovered I was working at Keith Davis, and I was wondering why I was so sleepy every night. <laughs> and I went to the doctor, and he said, you're pregnant. And I was absolutely overjoyed. I was so excited when that young man was born. I could not sleep for three days. It was the biggest high I've ever had. And then I got very lucky. I was 39. And then uh, Mike, Michael, his brother, was born uh, 15 months later. So it was boom, boom. I'll never forget the nurse at Mount Sinai Hospital in the labor room. She said, weren't you just here? I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I was. I said, I got very lucky. And I'll never forget that. She said, hmm, you look like you're going to have twins. I said, well, I wish I, I wish I were. I said, Noth nothing would please me more. I have a beautiful young friend who's just had twins, a girl and a boy. They were six months old a few days ago. They're gorgeous. I'd love to have had twins. But I consider myself very fortunate to have had uh, two sons, one at 39, one at 40. Mm -hmm. Then I tried, tried twice more and uh, had miscarriages. So I guess, I guess that book sailed. It wasn't meant to be. But I kept trying. Because you had established yourself as a performer, did you have a hard time juggling motherhood and performing? It was, it was hard. It was very hard. I wouldn't let them out of my sight. And I took them on every job. No nurse, just myself. And then uh, I would try and find a babysitter in the hotel or whatever, an apprentice to watch them backstage or whatever. It was, but it was so wonderful. And I had wanted them for so long that it, uh, it was very fulfilling. And it, it, nothing mattered except that I had them. And it was, it was all joyful. I never considered it hard work, although it, it was hard. It uh, takes uh, a lot of steam to do it all. But I survive. Here I am. Well, Julie. You know, as as Sondheim says, I'm still here. <laughs> well, it's great to have you back. And Thank you very much. Our time yeah. is up. And Thank you. I really appreciate your allowing us this opportunity. Well, I had a great visit with you, and thank you uh, very much for uh, thank your you. interest. This is Ryan Keating, and you've been watching Spotlight with Julie Wilson. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can write to myself in care of Perot Productions, 640 10th Avenue, New York, New York, 10036. Until next week, this is Ryan Keating for Spotlight. Have a good week. <laughs>